So uh, welcome to today's webinar everybody. My name is Martin Atkins here at the Energy Research Group at the University of Waikato and uh, today we'll be talking about pumps and pump systems again and uh, welcome for those to those who are joining us for the first time and uh, welcome back to those who maybe <coughs> have uh, joined us in the past. Uh, just a reminder that these webinars are sponsored by Eco Business and that the webinar today is going to be is being recorded and will be available uh, for viewing on the Eco Business YouTube channel as well as their uh, website as well. There is a page where they have uh, this web they'll have this webinar and also previous webinars that we've given uh, will be available for you to to review. Uh, also, if you have any uh, questions or any problems, there is a little portal to send through a question. Uh, please do that um, and we will answer them as we go or if it's easier we may just leave them for the end and then we'll have some time for questions at the end of the webinar as well. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to talk about pump curves and pump sizing and pump selection and go through some of the main aspects to consider when looking at selecting a pump for a certain uh, pump system. And we've, we've built on, we're going to be building a little bit on webinars that we've had in the past um, and some of it will be a review of that but, but certainly um, there should be some good advice and some good some good things to learn. So we're going to talk about a little bit about why are we interested in pump sizing and then we're going to have a quick review around pump curves and also system curves and why they're important and how they're really useful to have, in fact they're vital to have when you're looking at selecting a pump um, is understanding both the pump performance and characteristics and the system uh, characteristics as well. We're going to briefly talk about why so many pumps, industrial pumps are oversized and how we can deal with some of those. We'll also talk about uh, safety factors and uncertainty and, and how that plays a, a role in oversizing and then we're going to go through an example and we'll be looking at the example really to do with what what the effect of applying the safety factors have on the operation of the pump and the overall cost and some of the other um, other effects of oversizing. Okay, so just briefly as a as a reminder to us why why we're interested in pump systems, um, it's estimated that between twenty to thirty percent of industrial electricity demand is to do with pumping of some form or another. And you know, if we go around our, our process plants, um, there, there are a lot of pumps, especially for large sites, they may have several thousand pump systems or individual pumps, and so they soon add up to quite a large energy use. It's estimated, and certainly in my experience, that around 75% of our industrial pumps are oversized. And you know, that has a large implication not only on energy, but also on reliability and maintenance and of those pump systems. And we've, we've talked a little bit about uh, in the last pump webinar that we had earlier in the year around how operating a pump away from its best efficiency point can have a major negative effect on the pump performance and also the reliability of the pump because of the fluid dynamics that are occurring within the pump. Now, also too we have to keep in mind that because we're dealing with a pump system and not just with an individual pump, you know, the pump is only part of a, a wider system with a, a wider purpose, then it's important that when we look at pumping systems that we actually consider the whole system. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today is focusing on the system and matching the pump to the system. Okay, and just to reinforce the point, um, 
you know, this is a good study from Finland across multiple industries, multiple sites, um, where they evaluated around 1,700 individual pump systems, and they found that the average pump efficiency was below 40%, and you know there was this is a direct result of oversizing and uh, and the use of then a lot of throttling valves in order to control the flow of those oversized pumps and that also results in, in a high downtime. Okay, so we're going to just <coughs> pause for a moment and review pump curves and system curves. So hopefully um, this won't be teaching you how to suck eggs, but it's important just to review uh, what a pump curve is and the information that we may find from a vendor when we look up and we're looking for a pump. Okay, so here is a, a pump curve for the pump on the right and what it does is it captures the performance of the pump at different, as it will uh, go along the pump curve. So we just look at the pump curve here, it basically expresses the performance of the pump, how much flow rate the pump will generate at a given head or a given pressure drop that it has to deliver. And the three curves there, or the four curves, sorry, are for different impeller sizes. So it's very common to have a, a, a casing size and then having different impeller sizes available for that. Uh, and that's the, each one of those curved lines shows you the, the performance for each impeller size. Uh, more recently, uh, with the new pump selection packages that they have online, once you put in your, your requirements, it will actually give you a specific um, impeller diameter, and you know these can be machined down. <coughs> the, the supplier will, will produce one to that given specification. These other lines that cross are lines of constant pump efficiency, and so we can then use that to estimate what the pump efficiency will be, will be at a given point. And obviously there is a point on the pump curve where the efficiency is at a maximum. Now this other line is also important as well, especially where we have applications where we may have a variable flow rate in, in our demand. There is a, a minimum flow rate that the pump needs for continuous operation without any major <coughs> crises. So sometimes that's not actually given on the pump curve, but it will be uh, given in the, um, in the specification for the pump. There should be a, a recommendation of the minimum flow rate that the pump um, should be operated above that, above that uh, flow rate. Okay, and so if we have a given um, requirement, say for a certain flow rate, then we can look at what head the pump will produce at that at that flow rate, or vice versa. We may have a we may know what the pressure drop will be, and we're interested in what the flow rate will be at that certain um, that point. And then we also have a pump efficiency, so we can then calculate uh, the power requirement. <coughs> Also two, and sometimes they're all on the one page, I've just split them up, there will be a net positive suction head required, some information around that given for the pump, and in this particular case uh, it's down away from the pump curve proper, and so um, here we have the MPSH required by the pump, okay, for the different um, impeller diameters. Okay, so that's important information to, to have because we also need to make sure that our system has, there's a margin there that it has more net positive suction head available than is required by the pump, otherwise we're going to run into cavitation issues as well. And then often as well, um, there will be a power requirement as well, or, or the power uh, consumption a given operating point. Okay, so there's our net 
required net positive suction head and then so for a given operating point we can then look at and determine what the required NPSH is and also what the power um, consumption of that pump will be at that given operating point. Okay, so that pump curve had different uh, different impeller sizes. Um, often, or if you, you actually specify a um, impeller size and you're interested in variable speed, for example, then it's also important to know how the pump curve will operate under different operating speeds. <clears throat> and so this is uh, one of the pumps that I have down in the lab and uh, we, we specified the impeller size and we were supplied with pump curves at different um, pump speeds and our pump is uh, connected to a variable speed drive and so now we know the performance of that pump at different operating speeds as well and that, that's useful to know. If that's not provided there are some approximations that can be made uh, using the affinity laws to look at the pump performance but there are some limits to that um, in the accuracy, especially as you get down to, you know, sort of below 75-80% um, of the speed, then there can be some, um, some fairly high errors. Uh, and so it's useful if you can get this information from the uh, manufacturer or the vendor, then um, it's always useful to trust the, the vendor's pump curve um, more than some approximation. Okay, so there we have our pump curves for the different impeller speeds. And in this case, those lines are constant, lines of constant efficiency. Now, <clears throat> this is, we talked about this in previous webinars, but it's useful to reinforce um, this point is that ideally pumps, well, pumps are designed to operate within a very narrow range continuously and they can be operated outside of that preferred operating range continuously but there will be uh, not only some energy consequences but there will also be some performance and some reliability consequences and we've talked about those in the past but if you're planning to operate outside of that preferred operating range continuously or for long periods of operation then that's a, that's a a warning that this is not necessarily the right pump or the right um, sized pump for that application. And so I'd, typically you want to be for continuous operation between around 80 to 110% of the flow rate at the best efficiency point. And that's important to know <coughs> and there is an allowable operating range outside of that but that's really only for short-term operation. Okay, so we talked at length about this previously, and so you can go and have a look uh, at that previous webinar around off-design operating conditions. <coughs> okay, and we don't really want to be in those in those ranges uh, long-term. They're okay short-term, obviously not below our minimum flow rate. We can have some very quick um, Things happen, such as high temperature rise. If we if we have a very low flow rate, or we go below our minimum flow rate, but we, we actually don't want to operate. Now, if we have a, a a system which has a highly variable flow, then obviously we have to look at the control method, and maybe a variable speed drive or some sort of multi pump operation may be uh, more suitable than than a single pump operating outside of this range longer term. Now I'll just say something briefly about <coughs> system curves and and why they're important. Basically, you cannot really size a pump or select an appropriate pump and get the operating point where it should be unless you have some idea as to what the system characteristics are. Okay, so that that really is around what what is the, the pressure drop in the system as the flow rate changes. 
And this is important because one, we have to size the pump so we operate around that best efficiency point. And also two, if we're taking a, a life cycle costing approach, then that allows us to calculate what the energy costs will be over the lifetime of the, of the system. And, and that's important because typically a pump system, the energy costs make up anywhere from sort of 40 to 70 percent of the total cost of ownership depending on the situation. Okay, our capital cost is, is typically a much smaller component and so, you know, spending a bit more time in getting an appropriately sized pump can have a large effect on our total cost of ownership. And, and it's useful to, to look at different pump options as we go through, uh, as you're looking to select and specify a pump in order to, to compare the total cost of ownership. You know, one pump may be slightly cheaper up front, but you may pay for that in the long term in increased energy and maintenance costs. Okay, so taking a life cycle approach or total cost of ownership approach is, is very useful. And if you have a good handle on the system curve, then you know where the pump is going to operate at. And so you can then have a fairly good estimate of what the total life cycle costing for that pump will be. Okay, so let's just briefly go through a, a pump system curve and, and how that's derived. So in this particular case we have our we have our pump and we have our system. We're just pumping liquid between two tanks and there may be a heat exchanger in there for some reason. And there'll also be lengths of pipe, there'll be entrances and exits to uh, process equipment, there'll be valves um, there may be changes in uh, the, the pipe size or the pipe diameter, which will then have an effect on, on the pressure drop as well. And so we need to understand our pump system. And so from that, we can generate our pump curve. Okay, and the pump curve essentially describes the pressure drop as a function of flow rate for that particular system. And so if there is a static or an elevation difference between our, our two tanks, for example, then there will be a static head difference that needs to be overcome. So that uh, head needs to be supplied by the pump before any flow rate will occur. If we have a closed system, okay, then there is no static head difference and so the system curve will, will start at zero. But if we, if we do have any, any elevation difference between our, <coughs> our inlet and our outlet of our system, then there will be, <coughs> if there's any elevation difference, then there will be a static head and the pump curve, uh, sorry, the system curve will then start at that. And then we divide our our losses or our pressure drop in our system into two major components. There's what we call our, our major losses, okay, and our major losses are due to the friction or the pressure drop in the pipe lengths themselves. Okay, so if you have a 10 meter long pipe and you're pumping fluid through it, then there'll be a, a pressure loss or a, or a friction associated with that, and so that's the length, <coughs> that's our pipe friction. Then we have our minor losses which have to do with the pressure drop or the friction loss to do with all the bends and the valves and the processing equipment or whatever may be in our system and we call those minor losses. <coughs> and so we, we can generate a curve for our pipe friction and then we also add in our minor losses and so we get this overall system curve here which I'll highlight which is our final system curve. Okay, so there's three components that make up that system curve. Any static difference in static head, our major losses and our minor losses. Now, if we, if we are doing a, a, a design of a system, then there are ways to estimate what this will be. 
Um, there's some software that can help do this. Um, you can do it empirically by hand, um, and there's some different methods, and we will, uh, in the future, look at, in more detail, how we generate a pump system curve, so that we can estimate what our um, pressure loss versus flow rate relationship will be, because we really need to understand this in order to specify our pump. If we already have a system in place, then there are some ways to empirically <laughs> generate this curve um, with what's there already. Okay, so that's our system curve there. <laughs> and just as a reminder, our operating point of our pump will always be where the pump curve and the system curve intersect. Okay, you can't get around that. And so understanding our system curve, if we want to size our pump, really what we're trying to do is make the operating point at the desired flow rate or head at the best efficiency point of the of the pump. And then if there's any changes in our in our system, then we want to be able to look at well, where are we going to operate in our pump curve. Okay, so we're going to spend a few minutes talking about what things do we need to know or specify in order <coughs> to select a, a suitable pump and then also to size it correctly as well. Okay, so the first thing is really what we're trying to do or achieve is to select the right pump for the right job. Okay, we're trying to match the pump to our particular system. And it's important not only to look at, say, efficiency, but also to look at other aspects um, of that pump selection process. So we might want to look at a total cost of ownership, for example, when we're comparing different pump options, or look at, say, a reliability analysis. If, if this is a critical system, then you know what safeguards do we have in place in order to make sure that our system is reliable and if we have a pump that is, you know, oversized, then we will have reliability issues with that pump. And so how do we make sure we avoid some of those? So there are two main uh, sets of information that we require. Um, we have our, our process requirements, or our, what we call our hydraulic requirements, and then we have our pump characteristics. So what do we need from our pump in order of performance, and then what does that pump also need to have as far as mechanical properties or mechanical requirements in order um, to do that job efficiently in the environment that it will be in. Okay, so if we just take a second and look at the hydraulic aspects, then there are some system properties. So what is our flow rate that we need? And does that vary over time? What is the static head requirement of that system? And then what is the dynamic head? So that the dynamic head are the major and minor losses combined. What is the dynamic head of our system? How much net positive suction head do we have available in our system? That's an important parameter because if we select a pump with a too narrow margin, then we will have some problems. What is the suction pressure or the inlet pressure into the pump? Uh, what's the minimum flow rate that we will have on our system? Uh, total working pressure, how many service hours is the uh, pump expected to operate? And also how, we, how are we or how is the flow rate or pressure controlled? How is that system controlled? We also have to know what our liquid that we're pumping, some properties about that. So obviously you know, we have to know what type of liquid we're pumping, uh, its temperature or its range of temperatures that it may be at, um, what the vapour pressure is, that's important along with the temperature in order to know uh, are we going to have cavitation or not, what is the viscosity of the fluid. And it's important to note that our pump curves are usually only uh, that curve is affected by the viscosity. And so the curves that are published uh, uh, use water as their basis. And so if you have a highly viscous fluid, 
then that pump curve will have to be adjusted or you'll have to go to the supplier in order to get a, a, a pump curve that will reflect the liquid that you're pumping and its performance. Are there any solids in the liquid? If so, how much? What is the size of those solids? Okay, slurry pumping is, is a whole separate area fraught with, uh, <laughs> with problems. And if you do have a slurry that you need to, to pump, that can be done, uh, but you really need to know what the solids are. Even a very small amount of solids can have um, an effect on the pump that you, you actually uh, select. Not necessarily on the performance, but sometimes on the material selection of the pump. Okay, the density of the fluid is also important. And also, are there other characteristics of that fluid which need to be known. So for example, is it flammable? Is it explosive? Is it toxic? Things like that. Because that may then, for example, if it's highly toxic, then you know the seals that you may select, or the type of pump that you may select may be different than just if you're just pumping water. Okay, so those are important liquid properties that we need to know. So the hydraulic aspects, just to review, really have to do with what the system characteristics are, what the performance of the system needs to be, and also what liquid are we pumping as well. And then we get to mechanical aspects. What are we looking for in the pump itself? And so we're trying to select a pump of the appropriate size with an appropriate impeller diameter. There'll obviously be an efficiency to do with that operating point. There'll be a net positive suction head requirement to that pump, and so we need. That's why we need to know what our available net positive suction head, which is a property of the system, in order to make sure we have an appropriate margin. What is the minimum flow rate that that pump needs, and what speed are we going to operate the pump at? Okay, the speed is an important selection. Uh, typically in New Zealand, you know, a lot of our motors operate at around 1500 RPM, uh, but you know we may want to go to a higher speed uh, pump or, or lower, and, and that's, a, that's an important choice uh, to look at as well. What materials does the, need, does the pump need to be constructed of? You know, obviously we don't want corrosion happening within our pump, and so that's, that's why it's important to understand the fluid properties in order to correctly select appropriate materials. If we are going to have cavitation issues or if that's a concern, then that may also select um, the materials of construction and also if there are you know, abrasive particles or whatever as well, then we may select a, a higher hardness material. What operating environment is the pump going to be in? Is it going to be in a nice housed you know, production facility or is it going to be sitting outside um, in lots of rain, lots of dust and mud? You know, that's an important consideration. Bearings, how you know, depending on the type of pump, they may require some cooling. There'll be some sealing requirements for the seals potentially as well. You know, how are we going to couple the pump to the motor? Are there any safety protection requirements? If you're in a hazardous area or, you know, like a refinery or something, then there may be some additional requirements from a safety point of view for your pump. And then, you know, what maintenance regime or maintenance requirements will be required as well? And how are they going to be conducted? You know, sometimes we put equipment in places where they're hard to maintain and difficult to, to, to make changes to if need be. And so there's several aspects that we need to consider in what are we looking for in our pump, not only from our system point of view, but the properties of the pump, such as the materials itself. Okay, so we said before that a high percentage of our pumps tend to be oversized, and it's useful to just step back for a moment and look at well, why that is.
and there's several reasons that are cited. Um, first of all, I think the major one is that we're oversizing pumps because we're uncertain about what we really require, especially when it comes to our our pressure requirement or our head requirement of our pump. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But we're, there's some uncertainty in our hydraulic requirements of our pump system. That The other second thing is that we then sometimes apply safety factors to our sizing of the pump. And you can get into a situation where, say, the design engineer may apply a safety factor that goes off to some consultant or some supplier who may also then add an additional safety factor to that because they may not realise there's already one in there or they want to make sure that the pump they supply actually delivers uh, the, the job. And so additional safety factors can be applied. I've heard them described by a supplier as anxiety factors. And that really often reflects the uncertainty when you know, clients specify, this is what we need, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. The other thing that is often cited is that, well, you know, we want to expand production in the future. And, and that may be the case, sometimes that's just an excuse, but we want our pump to be able to, you know, have a, a higher performance at some future date as we expand. Now, that can be a legitimate reason, um, however, there are some ways, if, if that is a serious concern or, or reason to look at specifying a, a pump that may not be appropriately sized at the current operating point, then there are some tricks or some ways in order to, um, to future-proof our, our pump systems as well. Uh, the fourth reason is often we have a poor system or poor pump design, or poor piping design, sorry, and you know we, we actually don't need our valves you know, half closed and things like that. Uh, sometimes we're under urgency to get something done or to replace a pump, and so often uh, it's just easy to replace the pump with the pump that's been there for 20 years. And, you know, certainly you know, I can understand that. However, there's a cost implication both from a capital point of view, a reliability point of view, and, and an energy point of view from simply replacing an oversized pump with another oversized pump. The reason the pump may need to be changed in the first place is because it's oversized. So you haven't really solved the problem, and, and that's a reason why sometimes these things just perpetuate. And lastly, you know, we tend to be risk adverse, and so we want to make sure that our pump will operate at the point that we need it to. And so, look, we, we get a bigger pump, and we can either slow it down using a VSD, or we can just simply put a throttling valve on and we can we can deal with it that way. Now if we just go on and talk about uncertainty for a moment, <coughs> there's really two main parameters that are key to pump selection. Okay, so understanding what the flow rate requirement is and also what the total head requirement is. Okay, what do we need for our system? and we then can select an appropriate pump for that. And so that's why understanding the system curve is important in order to specify that with some degree of certainty. <coughs> okay. Now, there are other factors that we can also look at, such as our variability in our flow. We may have some uncertainty as to how much variability there will be, and also maybe something like the service hours. So there are other there are other factors which we may be there may be some uncertainty around exactly how much that will be, but the two key ones for selecting our pump really have to do with the flow rate and our total head, and we can split the the head requirement into our two factors: our static head and our dynamic head. And if we're really honest about all of this, usually most of our uncertainty has to do with how much dynamic head do we require? Okay, now if we just stop for a moment, typically our flow rate 
in many cases is a function of the of the process or the production rate. And so normally we have a pretty good handle on what the flow rate that we require is. Okay, so there's not much uncertainty there. It's usually pretty easy to know what our static head requirement is. Even at the design stage, if it's for a new system, <coughs> then we can look at, well, where is this tank going to be in relation to some other tank or some other operation and we can fairly accurately determine what the elevation difference will be. Okay, so we can have a pretty good or a small amount of uncertainty around what the static head requirement will be. And so if we know, if we're fairly certain around the flow rate requirement and the static head requirement, then that just leaves us with our dynamic head requirement. What is the pressure drop in all the piping and fittings and valves and bends and things? And that really is where we have most of our uncertainty is in that. And so at the design stage, obviously we can, we can look at how uncertain that is. It's important, and we'll talk about this in a future webinar around how you construct the system curve, there is inherent in the method there is a little bit of uncertainty around you know, the estimation of the friction loss in, a, in an elbow for example. But we can deal with that and so this is what we're talking about is the uncertainty really comes from this dynamic head component from our major and minor losses. And that's important to understand because when we talk about safety factors then what we apply our safety factor to uh, is important. And so really a safety factor is often just a reflection of how much uncertainty do we have around what we actually require. Now we can deal with it, we can deal with that uncertainty in other ways. So for example, rather than just adding a safety factor onto our, our head or our flow, then what we could do is we could perhaps select a different impeller size that will give us a margin that we can work with or if it's appropriate using a variable speed drive as well. <coughs> now that doesn't mean we just pick a large pump and put a VSD on it. Um, there will be some, some cost implications there. Uh, my colleague James Neal always reminds me you know, when you put a variable speed drive in there are some losses associated with that and then you have another another element in your system that potentially could fail. Okay, so there are some, some issues with that. But if we just go back to impeller size selection for a moment, it's often advisable to when you're selecting a pump is to not select the largest impeller size for that casing. Okay? The advice is, is typically you only want to select the an impeller size between or the maximum impeller size between 90 to 95 percent of the maximum impeller size for that casing because what that allows you to do is is to have a margin meaning that you can then if it all is a disaster you can put a larger impeller in that same casing which obviously is a lot cheaper um, then replacing the whole pump and that's one way that you can have some some degree of safety or, or wiggle room you know and and this the other thing that it does is it allows you to account or have a margin in case there are some factors that you haven't accounted for in your system curve <laughs> so for example um, you may have equipment fouling or there may be corrosion in your system which you haven't um, accounted for in your, in your design and, and in not specifying a, the, the largest impeller for that pump then gives you some degree of margin there as well. Also too if you're looking at say future production then what you may do is um, specify a much smaller impeller size and allow yourself to to then change that out 
uh, later on if there is a expansion and that allows you then to not have to replace the whole pump. Now obviously there are some limits to that um, and so you can then go through each individual scenario and look at well is this an appropriate way of dealing with um, our uncertainty. Okay, so if we just go back to safety factors for a moment, you know, what should they be applied to and how conservative should they be? Because we will pay, or someone will pay a price in, in capital, um, in both energy and, and the initial capital cost if our safety factors are not appropriate. Or we apply them uh, not in a good way. Okay, so first of all, avoid applying a safety factor on the flow rate. Usually we have a good handle on what the flow rate requirement is and as I alluded to before, you only, if you do need to apply them, only apply them on the dynamic head requirement, not on the static head requirement. Okay, okay so here's an example that I'll go through and we'll look at the implications of the safety factors that may have. So here we have our pump system and we simply want to pump between a couple of tanks. Um, we have a, a heat exchanger in there, there's a control valve and some other check valves, etc. And so we need to know our flow rate and our total head requirement at that particular flow rate. Okay, so you may have just hired a recent graduate, say Dave is his name, he's all excited, and you give him the job of finding <coughs> or selecting a pump and you say, look, the flow rate requirement is 100 cube per hour. Now he's heard, or you've talked to him about some future expansion plans, and so you want that taken into account as well. So if we have an expansion of 30%, then, and we're sizing our pump in order to deal with that later on, then our flow requirement will be up at um, 130 cubes per hour. And so, you know, Dave's a bit unsure, he wants to make sure this thing works, so he then adds another 10% on the flow rate just to be sure, just to make sure that the pump will deliver the 100 or the 130 cubes per hour. And so he goes away, um, first of all, there is a static head requirement in this particular case of, of I think this is about 5 metres here, and then he generates this lovely system curve. And you'll notice that at the, so we've had three different flow rates here. We've got 100 cube per hour, which is actually the desired flow rate. We've got 130, which is the, the future expansion uh, requirement. And then he's also added on his additional 10%. And so we've gone from 140, sorry, 100 cube per hour up to 140 cube per hour. And if we look at our head requirement based on our system curve, then we've gone from a head requirement of 18 meters all the way up to 33. So we've increased our flow rate requirement that we're going to look for a pump by 43%, but our head requirement has now gone up 83%. Okay, so that's important. To, to just be aware of. Now, if we go ahead and we select a pump for the uh, highest flow rate, then we also have to have as our head requirement that 33 meters of, of head. And so we will select a pump and we, we may select it so it achieves its best efficiency point at that point on the system curve. But what will happen is if we select this pump and we, our requirement is actually 100 cube per hour, then what will happen is our control loop will then throttle our, it will change the control valve to throttle the pump and so we will achieve the 100 cube per hour but then we will follow the pump curve back and because we're using a control valve in this case, what we're actually doing is altering the system curve by providing uh, more pressure drop in order to reduce our flow rate. And so the pump will actually operate at 
100 cubes per hour and the total head delivered by the pump will be 40 meters. Okay, so if we just compare uh, point A and point B, where we will actually operate is at point B. And so our head requirement, or the head delivered by the pump will be 40%. Because we move away from our best efficiency point, the efficiency is going to drop. So it may drop from, say, 80% at point A to 70% at point B. And so <coughs> the power that the pump will actually be uh, pulling at point B will be 15.6%, uh, sorry, kilowatts, 15.6 kilowatts. <coughs> However, if we'd correctly, if we'd size the pump initially for the 100 Q per hour and the system curve that we had, then our head requirement was only 18 meters. So this is this point C here. Okay, so we only needed, <coughs> if we'd had more certainty around this pump curve or more faith, sorry, in the system curve and not applied any safety margin, then we could have still picked a pump that operated that, at that point at its best efficiency point and we would only be consuming 6.1 kilowatts instead of the 15.6 at point B. Okay, so that's, that's quite a difference in the power consumption. Um, the other thing to note is if we'd selected the larger pump, then we're operating outside of that ideal operating range, and so there would have been an additional uh, maintenance requirement and reliability. So if we just follow that through in just the power cost, then the difference between that, if we take 8,000 hours a year and 10 cents per kilowatt hour, then if we'd selected the larger pump and operated at point B, then our total power consumption would have been around $12,500 per year, as opposed to $4,880 if we'd selected it more appropriately. And so that's quite a large difference. That's more than double um, the operating cost per year just by that amount of oversizing that we did. Okay, so there's a large increase in the operational costs. Obviously, if we select a larger pump, normally it's bigger, has more material in there, and so we require a larger pump, which costs more, and then also our motor will often be larger as well, and there'll be a capital cost implication as well. And as I mentioned just before, there'll be an increase in maintenance costs because the pump wear will increase the performance um, will decrease and the reliability will decrease as well. So that may, those increased maintenance costs uh, may be in additional seal wear and so you know you may have uh, more um, issues with that and, and higher maintenance costs. <coughs> okay so if we went back and, and only applied our safety factor or a safety margin to our dynamic head requirement, okay, if we go back to our original system curve, we can look at, well, what, what that would have done. So remember we had a static head requirement of five meters here, Let's see if I can, of five meters to begin with, <coughs> and so the difference between Dave's initial system curve and that, so that's 13 meters dynamic head requirement at 100 cubes per hour. So if we're not sure that that, you know, if we don't, if we have some uncertainty with that, then let's say we add a 20% a safety margin only on the dynamic head requirement. And so that's an additional 2.6 meters, okay, 20% of 13 is 2.6, um, and so we add that on and so our new head requirement will be 20.6 meters at 100 cube. Okay, so that's this dashed system curve here that I have on the on the figure. And so what we can do now then is select a pump based on that new requirement, 100 cubes per hour. <coughs> 
because we're happy with that that particular flow rate and the slightly higher head requirement okay now if we actually install this pump this larger one and Dave's system curve was spot on then what will happen is we will it will want to operate here and the um, control valve will just adjust much less now in order to bring it back to the desired flow rate and so the increase in pressure from that control valve will be much less than if we had that much larger pump <coughs> to begin with and so we will operate at this point C star at the higher the slightly higher head <coughs> obviously we're going to move away slightly from our pump our, uh, our best efficiency point but not as much as in the previous example and we will should be still within that that operating range that we want to be in for continuous operation there'll be an increase in the power but to a much less extent so in this case instead of being seven and a half thousand dollars per year in additional power if we'd only applied a 20 percent safety margin on our dynamic head then the the cost differential is less than a thousand dollars so much less and we'll have a much better um, pump selection with this particular case than we had before okay so just to wrap that up if we're designing a new system you know it, it pays to, to avoid oversizing pumps to begin with um, you know retrofits can be done but often you're not looking at replacing the whole pump that may be a very expensive option and so if you're looking at how to um, improve a current system then there are some things such as you know, maybe a variable speed drive is appropriate maybe impeller trimming is appropriate but you know there are some some things to work through before um, before you go ahead and do that and really it's around understanding what are our flow and our head requirements okay and are there any is there any variability to our our demand and any transient conditions such as start up and shut down that we also need to take into account and then also select a suitable control <coughs> flow control method now typically for variable um, demand situations a variable speed drive or multiple pumps with variable speed drives is a is a, is a efficient way but if we have a a continuous flow rate that operates for a long amount of time then you know having an appropriately sized pump with a throttling valve which is <coughs> not doing much um, then that is a is typically the more efficient one as well but we will have a, a um, webinar in the future around variable speed drives and appropriately selecting a flow control method so really what we're, we're trying to do is reduce uncertainty in order to uh, to get a good pump selection and a good pump sizing. Um, to do that you really need to ask hard questions of the engineers, uh, make sure that they understand what's going on and also if you can supply good data to them um, or in your analysis actually have good data uh, that, that's, that helps reduce that uncertainty consult with suppliers you know they they know a thing or two and they can help you um, especially with options around you know if you want <coughs> something more flexible around say impeller um, size selection especially if you want to future proof or give yourself a bit of a margin um, and understanding what the process requirements are as well okay so that's that's the end of, of that um, there's additional information here the ECA and the Energy Management Association of New Zealand there is a pumping systems audit standard which has a lot of information around how to assess and audit pump systems so there is the address for there it's freely available <coughs> and we have a couple of future webinars coming up um, in a couple of weeks <coughs> Dr James Neal will be talking about understanding compressed air demand uh, and then we have well, the next one well, we've got James for the next three uh, he's talking about flash theme fundamentals 
uh, making fan system efficiency measurements or effective fan system measurements. And then later in June, uh, we have Mr. David Addison from Thermal Chemistry uh, giving another webinar more focused this time on industrial boiler corrosion and deposition. Um, there are the registration links, obviously there'll be uh, more invites sent out and just an, a, another reminder that the past webinars are available on the ECA <coughs> YouTube channel. So that's all I have, <coughs> um, thank you for your attendance, if there's any questions please send them through and we can, we can deal with them now. Someone has their hand up, <coughs> I don't know if that's intentional, but yeah, if you have a question, please send it through, there's a little thing to type it. Uh, thanks Gordon. Yes, thank you, John. That, that's a good point. <laughs> John makes the point as far as, um, you know, if you're looking at, say, future expansion, <coughs> um, he says, you know, you can look at the life cycle, the total life cycle cost between having a large pump for 10 years or a small pump for five years and then followed by an increase in the five years. Absolutely, that's where you would look at, you know, what are some different options that you could have and what the cost implications are. <laughs> you know, often the energy savings that you would get by appropriately sizing the pump for five years of, of operation would more than pay for a, a replacement pump, a suitably sized pump later on. Uh, but there are some, some ways, especially if you're not talking a large increase in future production, then you know maybe just sizing a slightly sizer, a slightly larger casing with a smaller impeller and then you just change the impeller in the future. But you know, you just work through the options and using a life cycle approach as you as you say, that's a really good way of, of doing that. Okay, there's another question here about <coughs> running through the potential issues with running below the minimum flow rate. <coughs> um, yep, absolutely. Um, the webinar, the pump webinar that I gave last, which I think was in February, which is available on the YouTube channel, talks in depth about that, but I'll just give you the, 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 the main points. Um, what happens is as, the, as you operate below the minimum flow rate, or as you begin to move away from your best efficiency point, you end up with a lot of recirculation of fluid within the pump. So within the pump inlet, there'll be what they call suction recirculation and then also at the discharge. And what that does is it reduces the, uh, the static pressure there because of this high velocity zone, which will then cause cavitation as well. Also, if you go below that minimum flow rate as well, what can start to happen is if you think about the pump putting all this energy into the liquid and it's not exiting the pump, then that's a lot more friction within the pump and so what happens is you start to have a temperature increase <coughs> in your fluid. And especially for large pumps, that temperature rise can be very quick. And so, you know, you, the pump is really not designed to operate below that. And you end up having a lot of issues um, if you operate below that minimum flow rate. And so you have to build in ways of, of protecting your pump in order to do that. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> um, okay, thank you David. I think, I'm not sure what's currently up. I've, the VSD 
video. There are several um, pumps. Oh, there's, there's several webinars up on the Eco Business. I was pretty sure that the um, pump, the last pump one I gave was on there. It's called Off Design Operating Conditions or something like that. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll chase that up and make sure that um, that is um, <coughs> is loaded up. Okay, is this the case for VSDs? And okay, so if you have a VSD, um, then there is still a minimum flow rate that you need to make sure that you're operating at. And so um, all the VSD does is you know, reduce the flow rate, or, sorry, reduce the pump curve, and there will still be a minimum flow at that particular speed that it needs to be running at. And so that's important because all that a, a VSD does is change the speed of the pump, <coughs> but you still have the same, the, the same issues even at a lower speed. Obviously, <coughs> at a lower speed, some of the forces <coughs> involved are less, but even at a different speed, there's still a, a minimum flow rate that your pump needs to, to see. <clears throat> and this is where things like um, bypass returns are often used um, in order to, to make sure that the pump is, is having the minimum flow rate. But, but certainly, you know, if the... Um, no, the, the <clears throat> okay, so the question is, can this be reliably calculated using the affinity laws. The, the pump curve at a reduced speed, that can be, that can be uh, estimated with the affinity laws, but only within a certain margin. You don't really want to typically go below about 70% of the speed with the affinity laws because the error starts to get quite large. Um, there are some corrections that can be done, but if you can go back to the supplier and get a curve, a pump curve for the new speed, that's always much better than, than calculating it with the affinity laws. But you can do an estimate with the affinity laws, understanding their limitations, and then look at what the minimum flow rate will be. Sometimes they specify minimum flow rate as a percentage of the best efficiency flow rate. Okay, so it might be it needs 30% of the best efficiency flow rate that may be the minimum flow. And that would be applied to the new pump curve at the lower speed. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Jonathan, for your comment. Yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> I, I should get a, a, a pump cost difference. Um, yeah, certainly, if you're if you're pumping, you know, 150 cubes per hour, um, that will be mu a much bigger pump than than the point B and C, as as you point out. Um, and so, not only is there a, a cost saving or a cost, a power cost implication, there's a capital cost implication. Thanks for that feedback, I should probably add that in, um, just to reinforce that point. All right, well thank you, thank you for your, your feedback and your, and your questions. Uh, if there's any more, I'll stay on the line for a few more minutes. Um, if not, thank you for your attendance and, and have a good day and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks guys for the feedback, I'm going to, it's the last question so we'll, we'll end the webinar now, thank you.